Well, let's turn up to Peter, to Peter, chapter 3. And we're just going to read from verses uh, 3 to 15. And as we do that, just to explain to my team and anyone else who's visiting or hasn't been here for a while, we, uh, through our summer weeks, we're going through a, a series on the fruit of the Spirit. And back in Galatians, where we see this list of what it looks like to be a Christian with the Holy Spirit residing within us, and we see this wonderful list of, of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives as a purpose for it. It, it helps us to crucify the flesh, to determine to live for Christ now, uh, even though we still are struggling in a world of sin and we're still struggling with sin ourselves. The fruit of the Spirit should be released, should be prayerfully gained in our lives so that we can crucify the flesh. It means keeping in step with the Spirit through our reading of the Word regularly and through keeping our prayer life active. And in all of that, it then impacts positively on the church as well, Paul reasons, in that it can crush conceit, you know, that prideful attitude that can uh, appear at times and be a cause of division in church life, and even through a week that we're about to embark on together as Christians. So it's important that we think about and examine uh, the fruit of the Spirit. But this morning we're thinking about the fruit of patience. So let me just read this passage from verse 3 of 2 Peter uh, chapter 3 and think about this subject. Knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth are, are now ex that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. For the day of the Lord will come, like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace and count the patience of our Lord as salvation. May God bless the reading of his word. So this morning we're thinking of the fruit of patience. Am I the only one here who struggles with impatience? <laughs> Um, I don't know, I've noticed that as I get older, I'm a little bit more passive, Sharon may disagree, but, but patience, um, my impatience becomes something that I keep within myself. When I was younger, it used to come out with anger, it used to come out with unnecessary tension and difficulty perhaps in the home because I was expressing my impatience and it was presenting itself through anger and it wasn't helpful for anyone in the home. So maybe you struggle with impatience. I think we all do. Um, and you know that moment, you know, when you're online, maybe watching a program and it freezes. And even that can cause you to be impatient, can't it? How annoying to have to wait for the scrubbing to stop and the program to keep going. And then there's the pain, isn't there, of waiting for the right relationship or the right exam results or if you're not well, 
waiting for the right test results, or you're looking for that job that you really want that you still haven't got, or even just this week when you're having to listen to someone and not interrupt, even when you're convinced that what they're saying is wrong. It all brings us to being impatient, doesn't it? So hard to be patient through our own strength. And we might try and rush into the things we really want or say, what we're dying to say, and that's when our impatience can bring on a whole new set of problems in our lives, of course, all undergirded with our sinful fallenness. It all started, of course, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve's impatience with God, prompted by the temptations of the devil, caused them to break God's law. They decided to believe Satan's lies. It caused them to think that God's provision wasn't enough, and so they impatiently grasped for more when they grasped the fruit. And since then, every human being has been plagued then with impatience, wanting things they don't have now. And people run their own lives believing the lie that they know better than God who has made them. And so, yes, impatience is part of our fallenness, isn't it? But we know that Jesus modeled something very different. Jesus modeled perfect patience on earth. He showed us through his obedience and suffering and death what patience actually looks like and before God what patience is and how it is connected to this willing obedience to God. And so the question this morning is how does the Holy Spirit give us Christ-like patience? Well we need to think about God's patience if we're to know the fruit of his patience and work through us. And in this passage this morning, that we're going to look at for a few minutes, Peter shows us how God is patient in three ways. And we see how God is patient. As we see that, we can express the fruit of his patience through the fruit of the Spirit in our lives today, through this week of teamwork, and as we serve together. And the first thing we see in verses 3 to 6 is that God is patient with his promises. God is patient with his promises. God's promises, of course, we know, stand forever because he is forever. He is eternal. But let's just have a look at those verses again in verses 3 to 6. There's a mention there of scoffers, isn't there? What does it say? Knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own desires, and they will say, well, where is this promise of this coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water, and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged or flooded with water and perished. And by the same time, way, the word tells us that the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? Peter warns, doesn't he, that the world is full of natural scoffers. Impatient scoffing goes on all of the time. It presents itself in the world of academia, in terms of atheism in academia. It presents itself in terms of what we hear on the news and what we hear on Radio 4 during a lot of the day when you turn on a programme. There is this scoffing attitude to all that God says and all that the Bible says. And the Bible, of course, promises Jesus' return. And the world's reasoning is, well, everything's just going on generation after generation. Oh, it's just a slow day-by-day -day process of time through the centuries. And so people with a scoffing attitude, whether educated or not, ask, well, where is he? This is the common, fallen, impatient, scoffing, mocking, dismissive attitude of those who do not have the Holy Spirit. But you see what the text tells us in verse 5. This attitude is due to a deliberate choice. See there in verse 5? It is a deliberate choice amongst people to forget or reject the truth that there is a God who's made everything. 
And people without Christ twist the original understanding of how the world was made by the living God and have taught themselves alternatives and push God out. And a lot of people believe the lies that are pushed concerning the world and its origins. And in so doing, they choose to forget about God's future promises concerning his judgment for sin that we saw in the past with the flood and that we see verse 7 reserved for the future through fire. They choose to forget those, time when, those times when God's long-suffering patience towards sinful people ran out in ancient history. And also people who reject God and his eternal nature scoff at the flood, which in fact God uses to point to the true prospect of future judgments. What this world is reserved for in the future. We see what it is in verse 7. The proof of the pudding is the flood of the past, that God is going to judge the world. But we see he's going to judge in a different way. See verse 7? By the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So God isn't just patient with his promises. I hope you can see that. God is also eternally patient with his purposes. Just looking at verses 7 to 9. God is patient with his purposes, which are, of course, behind his promises. So by willfully forgetting all of these things that we read in those previous verses, 3 to 6, that God is a God who's pure and holy and can't stand sin and judges sin and has demonstrated this in the past. As people forget all of that through deliberately choosing to do so, people are immersed in these lives of impatience. We want everything now. In the materialistic West, we want the best house. We want the perfect home. We want the perfect car. We want all of this now. And we'll get into debt to get it. We see impatience everywhere, don't we? And we ourselves, in terms of our lives without Christ, we can cut corners with sinful habits and desires. But that verse 7 just won't go away, will it? It's based on things that have already happened in the past. And verse 7 tells us that God has a purpose then behind his patient promises concerning Christ and his return at the end of history. And the purpose is what? Do you see it in verse 7? The purpose behind God's patient promises of judgment is his judgment and the destruction of those who impatiently reject him in their lives. I want to say that again. The purpose behind God's promises, specifically the return of his son, the Lord Jesus, is the judgment and destruction of those who impatiently reject him today. You see, they reject that God is eternal by nature, verse 8 explains. Uh, he is eternal by nature in his existence, as he expresses his promises and purposes. They are all held and expressed outside the limitations of time. Do you ever wonder about that sometimes? That we are very, very hemmed in by the reality of time. We take it for granted, don't we? And some of us are very good at keeping time, others less so. But do you ever consider the fact that we are hemmed in by this thing called time? But God exists outside of it. And so his purposes and promises do not be, need to be proved by our notion about how long it's taking. Because we're inferior to him. We exist within this restraint of time. And so due to God's eternal nature then, of course God isn't slow in keeping his promises. He's not forgetful or lazy or useless as God-haters want others to believe. Rather, he is patient. He's being patient with you right now if you're still rejecting him this morning and want to live life according to your own rules. He remains patient patient, not wanting you or I or anyone else to perish. 
Of course, if we know the Lord Jesus this morning, we know that, but we can still struggle with our impatience. And as an example, I just want to read a, a verse that can be frequently misunderstood by even believers at times. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Perhaps some of you know it already. What does it say? Jeremiah is inspired to write and say, uh, God speaking in the first person. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Brother and sister in Christ, are there times that you're feeling impatient because you read a verse like that and think, well, I don't feel as if I'm prospering. I have been greatly harmed so far in life and I don't really have much hope and I don't think my future looks particularly bright even though I'm trusting in Jesus. And it may feel quite difficult for you today, this morning, as a believer. Uh, you may have struggles with family, and finance and relationships are not what you hope for. And yet you know this verse, Jeremiah 29 verse 11, does that mean that you are part of God's patient promise this morning? Has God let you down? Does your impatient dismay, because it doesn't feel as if Jeremiah 29 11 is working in your life, leave you with a little cautiousness towards God? You would never express to the pastor or anyone else, but maybe a coldness slight coldness and a sense of obligation to church now that you feel you're a bit disappointed with this Christian walk. Well, can I say to you that we can very easily misunderstand and miss that all of God's promises and all of God's purposes are only fulfilled in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the plans, as we read in Jeremiah 29, for example, God has for those in Christ are still faithfully true. Uh, God is addressing his people in Jeremiah. He's addressing the prospect that he is saving a people who will have a future to the extent of eternal life. And they didn't fully know what that knew what that meant at that time. But we know what it means because we have seen, we have understood through the spirit who the Lord Jesus is. Christ has come. He has suffered He's defeated death so that we may be victorious in him over sin and death. And we may be rich or poor. We may have hard times in life. We may have disappointing relationships and broken relationships. But the promises and purposes of Christ remain true. That is how God's promises are all fulfilled. Not in our hopeful exam results. Not in our presumed good health not in the lifestyles we aspire to, but in his promises to secure his people, the church, eternally in Jesus Christ. So no, God is not slow, he is patient. And he is patient for a gracious reason, and that patience of God is resting on you this morning, especially if you still haven't reached out to him in faith. God wants everyone to realize that we live in patient, sinful lives, wanting to make ourselves happy and secure on our own terms. But what does it say in verse 9? Towards the end of verse 9, you see it there? What he wants is for us to turn to him wholeheartedly, 100%. To turn from our sinfulness, our impatience, and trust in him. That is to stop then impatiently running after our desires and turn round to face his loving care and glory and provision of eternal life through Jesus. Has that happened in your life yet? Have you changed your mind? Is your mind now fully caught up and identifying with the promises of Christ presented to us this morning through the work of the cross where forgiveness is found and eternal life is given as we walk with Jesus. See, God is patient. But all, not only that, he shows us 
what patience looks like, what the fruit of patience in the believer's life looks like in verses 10 to 13. Maybe just to recap, let's read it. We see from verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be? Well, we're supposed to live lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. And we're looking forward then to something else. See verse 13, according to his promise, we are then waiting for a new heavens, a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Friends, in these verses, we're getting a vivid picture concerning Christ's return. It is going to happen... And it is going to be traumatic and shocking, especially for the scoffers, especially for those who haven't turned to Christ in this life. It's going to be beyond our imaginations, and yes, it's going to be disturbing, to say the least. Look at verse 10 and the end of verse 12 again. You see the description of what this world is reserved for in verse 10. It's going to come unexpectedly, the Lord's return. It's going to come with a roar and everything will be burnt up and dissolved and the earth and all the works that are done in it will be exposed. They'll all be laid bare, it says in the NIV. And we also see in verse 12, towards the end of verse 12, everything will be set on fire, dissolved, the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. That's not very comfortable reading, is it? Especially if all that you are and all that you think is all firmly attached in this world. It's temporary. It's going to burn, folks. I don't want to labour the point. But I think it's important to understand if you're to have any concern and motivation to trust in the risen Lord. Because his return is going to be unexpected. Nobody's going to be counting down uh, to a particular day. I remember when I was in Dublin in the 90s. There was a thing that, of course, the Dubliners call something else. It was, a, it was a countdown clock in the River Liffey. When you're going over the bridge, you look down, you see a digital countdown to the year 2000. And, of course, the Dubliners called it the Toym and the Sloym. But it, but it was just a countdown clock that was telling you when two th the year 2000 was going to come. Uh, but we're not going to have a countdown clock to Christ's return. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we do know it could happen at any time. Because his work is done to bring a people to himself. He has ascended to heaven, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he is waiting for that signal to return at any time. And when we read then the rest of verse 10, we read complete and utter destruction of this world and the heavens above. And I can't imagine that. I can't imagine what that's going to be like, but I know it's going to be awesome and shocking as we see this world die. And then in verse 12b as well, we, we read about flames. We read about complete fire. And of course, we know a lot of folk in Greece and Italy and other parts of the Med know exactly what that's like as they're experiencing a snapshot, really, of the world's end. So here's our future reality, folks. Everything burns. And that brings us to our approach then to living in response to that truth that this world is temporary. How should we live in the present if this future is true? Well, what does or do lives in Christ look like? What does the fruit of God's patience look like in our lives? Well, look at the end of verse 11 and verse 12. Here is what patience looks like. Looks like, sorry. You ought to be living lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. That, it's simple, isn't it? Christian fruit of patience in the Holy Spirit is focusing our lives not on, oh, I want this, I want that, I need this career, I want that house, I want that holiday. Rather, our real focus, our inner core of our being will be 
How can I please the Lord today? How do I follow him today? I need to be part of a church and be an accountable member of a church. I need to get baptised, just as Kerry told us, if we're professing faith in Jesus. Because, uh, because that's what I should be about today, because of everything that I see here in these verses. I need to be all out for Jesus. I need to set my life apart from him, because he's coming back. And yes, he is a patient God, and he's remaining patient with me right up to right here, right now in your seat. But I need to live for him. Because we know that this isn't all there is. And you know, the mantra of our age is eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And you, you know, we maybe see that when we're students and we find that hard to deal with with our peers because it seems to be perpetual partying. But that's not real life. Real life is understanding that Christ is going to return and so we calibrate the way we live according to the fact that he's going to return. And that is the fruit of patience in the believer's life. Holy and godly lives. But lastly, before we finish, we want to see that God is patient with his people. He is patient with us. And maybe you've come in here this morning with a completely different focus uh, on uh, 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 other than what it means or your concern to walk with Jesus. Well, I want you to remember that God is patient with his people. Have a look at verse 14 and into 15. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these things, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count, listen to this, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Count the patience of our Lord as salvation. You see, Peter's making a connection then between living a godly and pure life in Christ with us understanding that God has been patient with us. And God continues to be patient with us as his people. And that his patience really means that he is saving us. But this does raise a couple of things before we close. It, it, it raises uh, this uh, with God's patience. It, it gives us this opportunity to make our own salvation certain. First of all, by learning to live out our faith through a godly lifestyle with all our growth in him and, and, and failure at times as well that we're trusting in him. And second, we see that God's patience helps us to have a patient concern for the lost. So I want to explain that. God makes us like Jesus instantly when we trust in him. And I want to assure you of that. If you're here in your sins and wondering where you are with Jesus, as you trust in him, he declares you perfect, qualified for heaven, not because of you, but because of your faith in his son, the Lord Jesus, God will legally declare you as perfect, and therefore suitable for heaven. It's amazing, isn't it? So we know that when we trust in Christ, he instantly makes us right for heaven, heaven but he also exhibits his patience in our lives as we're called to prepare to meet him for the rest of our lives. He remains patient with Andy and the rest of us. As we go, go through our up and down days or up and down weeks and get this wrong and say that stupid thing and think that sinful thing and make that sinful choice, God remains patient with his people. So we have to work on being patient with ourselves and with others. How patient are you with yourself as a Christian? Do you get inappropriately stressed? and depressed when you think oh i've done it again i failed oh maybe i'm not a christian or oh, maybe i'm fooling myself because i'm always getting it wrong why can't i be perfect we beat ourselves up at times don't we we can feel crippled by our sinfulness but isn't that exactly why christ came isn't that the purpose of his ongoing work in us he has taken away our guilt so that we are freed up to just keep walking with him. And when we fail, 
And when we test God's patience, we can remain confident in his patience and willingness to forgive us as we bring our sins to the cross. Christian friend, don't get tied up in knots over your inevitable failures. Bring them to the cross and remain in Christ. You know, that's not a license to embrace sin, of course. But neither should we be paralysed by guilt as the Lord's people. That is a lie of Satan if that is what we're doing. We need to keep walking with Christ and bring our sins to him, confident, trusting in the completeness of his sacrifice for us. But just as with the fruits, uh, Spirit's fruit of patience, we ought to be patient then with ourselves. Uh, we, we must work on being patient with each other. And hey, what a wonderful week. Now's the chance. Now's the opportunity for Andy to bite his lip at times, as well as others, and for us to exercise patience because we've learned that God is patient and if he's in us and if we're trusting in him we are going to be able to exercise divine patience amongst others because you're going to see my faults this week and I'm sure plenty of you here have seen loads of them already but you're going to learn about my faults if you don't know me very well and I'm going to learn about yours uh, and it's going to be easy just to go off and complain to somebody else rather than the person who's offended you know, morning, weren't they? They really made me impatient. But we're going to have to love each other. We're going to have to show patience. And yeah, we're doing this because we're meant to be reflecting God's love. Who, he is love. And he has been eternally patient with you and me all along, even after he saves us. He remains patient with us. He gives us time and space to grow, to make our mistakes even, to trust in him and to change into the likeness of his son over the years of our lives. And so we, if we understand that, will be patient with others. You know, people leave churches because they've run out of patience. They run out of patience with people and they go, that's it. I'm away. I'll write a nice letter to the members meeting. See ya. It's impatience. They've lost the fact that God is patient with them. It's a hard thing to keep going and to remaining trusting in God and expressing his patience. And then when we look beyond ourselves and our relationships within the church, of course we need to invest time and energy into people. We need to pray and continue to reach out. And we must remain patient then, even if we don't see people clearly being saved through our witness. What are your expect expectations for this week? We, we, we want to see people saved. But we might not see people saved this week. But we leave that with God. We remain patient as we serve him thoroughly and with a good heart, knowing that he in his patience is dealing with every person that we will reach, young and old. You see, only God can give us this patience. 